Hi guys and welcome back to Do More. This episode is actually quite an interesting one. It is the first uh, of six sessions that we're doing with uh, CGS CIB in Endeavour called the Thoughts Inspire series where we talk to entrepreneurs about the success journey and how they made it in their business and ongoing success. The first session of course was with uh, CY Lim of uh, Yinsen. I first met Yinsen about 10-12 years ago when they were just a very small uh, company, 17 million ringgit market cap. Today they're about 6.7 million ringgit. So he talked about that 100x increase in market value over the last 12 years and all the trials and tribulations. So there'll be many more of these uh, sessions coming up in the next uh, few series with CGS EMB and Endeavor under the Scots Inspire series. So of course, if you're an entrepreneur, you want to try and make it big and try and make it into a unicorn, uh, do come back and do hopefully uh, come and subscribe and, and like and comment on these videos to glean more insights and more um, uh, I guess um, inspirations from some of these successful people that I'm going to talk to. Take care. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, very honoured that you spent your time uh, with us, me and CY. Thank you to Rosie and CGSEMB for giving us this opportunity and of course Adlin and Endeavour and of course, Fira for helping organize all this. Without you, uh, both, in fact, this event cannot have happened. So I just want to talk about CY. And uh, I, f I first came across uh, CY on air at BFM in 2010, just 12 short years ago, right? When I was doing my research for uh, checking out C Yinsen at the time, 67 million ringgit market cap, uh, doing logistics uh, services. One of the biggest truck haulages uh, in, the uh, in the country, by doing fresh food bunches, right? In, t in, 10 short, in 12 short years, he's got 100x in market value to 6.7 billion ringgit. Now that's incredible, right? That's the kind of growth you see with uh, people like uh, Facebook and Google, not with <laughs> oil and gas service providers, at least the world on in haulage. So I want to talk about that scale up with you actually, CY, and that, that those early years where you were able to, you know, really uh, have the courage to see that the, the changes coming, the challenges coming, but then to put your money where the mouth is. So talk about those early years, right? And how difficult of a time was it? I think the hardest part is losing too much hair in that process. <laughs> you know. But I, I think no, no journey is easy. There's a lot of risk taken. Um, you know, and, and people that know, you know we, when, when I started out, um, the company is actually founded by my father. And, and of course, it was not, um, not at that uh, today's size at that time. So I think getting alignment from my father, getting him to, to, to back this growth you know, and it was, was something that, that, that we had to communicate. But, but I guess you, know, you, you make a lot of mistakes along the way and if you, if you treat every mistake as a learning process, I think that that's the most important thing. And, and you know, I appreciate the mistakes we made and we continue to make mistakes today. Um, but every mistake we make, I think we, we, we end up getting stronger and learning from it. Um, you know, capital, you know, we, I, I, sometimes you think about it, we were a 67 million ringgit company, then um, over the last 12 years, we built our asset base to, to more than 10 billion ringgit today. Um, and so it's a very capital intensive business. So along the way, we needed to, you know, to, 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 to maintain our shareholding as much as possible in a very capital intensive business. So we needed to make sure that we recycle capital, address our, um, engage our shareholders to understand it's capital intensive, our clients. So uh, I think a lot of the process um, of difficulty um, has, has got a lot easier when you start engaging. You know, you identify your stakeholders of your lenders, your shareholders, your client, your vendors. This engagement process is very important and get them to buy into your vision, your, 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 what you're doing. and and, and yeah, I think that, that's, that's the key thing. So, uh, yeah, it, it's not been an easy journey. Um, today, it's still not easy. You know, you, you always need to be, um, no, look out for what, what's next and what, what's happening in the world. Um, like Ruzi said earlier on, no, you, you see oil and gas um, being one of the sectors that's being hit by um, you know, environmentalists, you know. And, and you yourself believe that you know, the future needs to address climate change. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a you know, fun 12 years and I think the next 12 years would be equally fun no, with all these changes. Um, well, you still look young, CY, and uh, to, you know, 12 years ago you must have been even younger, right? So, you know, when you come to talk about stakeholders, whether it's the bankers or the shareholders or your partners, 
I'm, I think the biggest stakeholder for you would have been your father, right? Because, you know, you come from a family holding company and they are notoriously averse to change, especially China. Well, uh, you know, I'm China, so I can't say it, right? Um, <laughs> do, do you know what I mean, right? So, so how did you convince, uh, how, how, did, how did the belief between your dad and you exist for you to say, okay, let's, let's put our money where our mouth is. And I think your forays in terms of pivoting was into port, uh, port cargo uh, management in Vietnam, right? That's right. So how did that happen? I think I got a great father, you know. My father is very supportive, you know. He supports the children in whatever they do. So first of all, you know, having a supportive father helps, helps a lot in the whole process. Um, and, and, and today he continues to support, you know, we are, we are, if you know Yinsen, we are doing a rights issue and he's, 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 he's okay to support and things like that. Um, and, and my father likes growing, growing businesses, you know, and, and he, if he thinks that this business is something that can grow and the children is growing it, I think he, he's more than happy to, to back the growth. So over the years, I think he's been very supportive with advice, with, with capital as well. Um, so, so I think that, that was not the, the toughest part. I think toughest was bring other external capital into the business, strategic partners into the business, you know. Another strategic partner that we have was EPF. You know that I know. You know we are thankful that they they, they believe in our growth and they came in earlier. Um, you know, and and I think they're quite important for for Malaysian businesses, right? Supporting supporting companies with capital to grow. Um, yeah. So so I think I think yeah. Got got my father wasn't that difficult because he's been very supportive all, all the while. Yeah. Yeah. So that hundred x market cap growth in twelve years must be part of the reason why I think my EPF. Uh, Dividend this year is going to be quite nice, right? Um, thanks to you, CY. Um, you know, but back in the day, 12 years ago, right? Um, I, I think I asked you this as well. Going from a main, in fact, completely domestic business in Malaysia to dealing with the Vietnamese in terms of um, and and just the, and the Vietnamese government to boot, right? How difficult of a challenge is that? I mean, it, for instructively speaking, for local businesses now that are trying to regionalize, which we have no choice but to to regionalize, right? Talk about those challenges. I think a lot of people make a mistake. You know, I, I, every time we invest in a country, everybody tells us, "Oh, can you do this country? Oh, how do you do business in that country? You can't do this country. No, every if you can't if you can't do business in every country, then it, it's tough, right?" I think it's it's the 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 the, the need to understand that you know, in our business, a global business, you need to go to different countries to do your business, and 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 Vietnam is just one of the countries. Of course, we started in Vietnam. Um, and and I, I appreciate the Vietnam, our Vietnam partners for giving the opportunity to start in Vietnam. Um, but you know it, it, it's a learning curve, right? Our first asset that we did, you know, um, from a, was was in Vietnam, and from there on we did more and more assets, and we just got better at um, executing. I think a lot of people fail to fail to localize themselves. You know, when when we were doing Vietnam, I think I remember. That was the only one thing that I had to do was to make sure that our FSOs and FPSOs was going well. It's one of our biggest investments, um, and and really understanding, you know, understanding how the local people work, understanding, um, you know, how to partner them. You know, different countries have different culture. Understanding their culture, and I know, and 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 really, really just go being lo you know, globalized, but being local, right? And and at the same time, and, and I think that that's that has helped a lot. Understanding how to work with them, building that chemistry. You make it sound so easy, but then some of the biggest companies in Malaysia have tried. I mean, you say it's easy, right? But you try and go to Indonesia, notoriously difficult. India, you know, people like Ananda Krishnan have tried, uh, Tony Fernandez have tried, to some to varying degrees of success, right? So what kind of like um, lessons can you prefer the audience in terms of, um, you know, dealing with, with, a, with a different culture, different language, different way of doing business? And you, you, you said you made mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. So talk about those mistakes, because from mistakes comes growth and, and lessons. Yeah, I, I think I think we 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 spend time looking for the right local partner everywhere we go. Um, we we don't go in a country by reading the papers tomorrow and they said the economy is booming in Vietnam. Let's go in Vietnam, right? We actually spend time studying who are the local partners we work with. Our part local partner in Vietnam is is a subsidiary of Petro Vietnam, reputable client. You know, you know, you know they have good balance sheet as well. Understand what they're doing, respects the contract. You know, so. A lot of people jump into partnerships without knowing the partner well. I think we, we actually get to know the partner uh, one or two years at least before we form a partnership. Like for Brazil, we, we started Brazil, we started up Brazil, you know, I think four years, three years.
before we won our first project was really to understand the local market, starting our office there, having someone to run around, um, no feedback, who are the right partners to have, how should we execute our job. You know, so a lot of the, the background work has to be done before you go into a country. Um, and, and, and you know, we, we, a lot of people always send, put the top team in their HQ, right? And, and they send team C or team D to a country where they're growing. And I think that's the biggest mistake. You know, Vietnam was grown by, by, by you know, it started from me. You know, I was there, you know, trying to grow that part of the business. But even today as we grow, we always send our team A to the new countries that we work in. And, and on top of that, we, we localize. We, we, you know, like our office in Ghana, for example, you know, there's only one expat there today, you know, in Nigeria. It's full, fully Nigerian. So we really localize where we are. And, and we don't call it our Nigerian people or what. It, they're just part of Yinsen, right? And you know, they, they participate in group activities. They participate in, in, in understanding where the group is going. And I said engagement is very important. The, you know, our employees are our stakeholders, right? We have to engage with them, let them understand where we are going as well. And, and I think this engagement, you know, and, and, and localizing where you are, I know it's easier said than done, but it, it takes a lot of effort, right? You know, I have a good comms team, you know, and, you know, always updating the foreign officers about what we are doing. Um, and, and yeah, I, I guess that, that's, that's how we do. So it's interesting because Yinsen is a company which um, is one level removed from the vagaries of the oil price, right? Uh, you deal essentially, your clients are the national oil companies, the Petrobras of this world, the Petro Vietnams of this world, and they are notoriously uh, sticky in terms of quality assessment, right? So when you came to them and when you continue to go to them uh, as a player, right? How, what kind of criteria do they, do they look at you and say, right, these guys are ticking the box what are some of the things that they look out for, the top, say, three or four criteria? I think robust policies, you know, when, when you deal with big clients, you, you have to have robust policies internally, right? Things like, you know, your ABAC policy, you know, your health and safety policy, things like that. Um, I, I think beyond that, um, they, they really look at your people, right? Um, uh, paper, all the paperwork done, beyond that, it's really the people. I, I think we try our best and we try to recruit the best. And today, on top of recruiting the best, we try to train our own. You know, try the best, try to train the best our own our own way. You know, in our own way, our own core values, our culture, um, so that they they are Yinsenites, right? And and I think that's what we try to do. I I I think also track record. I think we are we're pr proud to say you know our assets have been ninety nine point nine percent, you know, available to all our clients. You know, throughout our safety records is high. You know, we are very digitalized. You know, we, 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 on top of today, right, we, we are talking about ESG. You know, we are very aware of ESG. You know, we really track our carbons to, to on every asset um, so that we can account for them. You know, in the next, in the next couple of years, we, we're trying to get ourselves carbon neutral, right, with our new investments. So I, I think beyond, beyond, beyond just policies, beyond people, is also the vision of the company going, going, going green, right? It's something that, that a lot of these clients look to today. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to understand the secret sauce, right? Because what you've just enunciated, CY, seems at a headline level to be quite vanilla. I mean, every company wants to have the right team, the right ESG policies, the right health and safety, especially in your field. I think a little hint of that came from, a little hint of the secret sauce came when you said, when you go around the world, you send team A, you don't send team B, team C, team D, which I think maybe, maybe other companies have made the mistake of doing in the past, right? Um, what do you think you did right, whether in Ghana or whether in Nigeria, whether in India, whether in you know, Brazil or, or Vietnam, what things did you think you did right in terms of convincing those NOCs to work with you? I think track record, right? Like I said, no, they But uh, even in, in those early years, I mean, you've only been doing this 12 years, 12 years. It's a blink of an eye in the oil and gas world, right? Yeah, 12, 12 years, and, and, and if you look at a lot of our peers have fallen out. No, when we entered the business, it was a eight, nine player business. Even before that was a 50 player business. Today, it's like a three to four player business, right? So, so a lot have fallen out. So I don't think that if you're an oil company, you want to do a billion dollar FPSO today, there's not more than a handful of companies that you can choose from. Uh, the last couple of bids that we bid in, bidded in, we are the only bidders. Right, so first of all, I think the supply demand is, is, is towards the supply side. So 
I, I think they, they have to choose whatever's on the market as well. And track record, right? You know, we've done about six, seven FPSOs and all on budget on time. And, and I think that's something to, to know. My people have done a very good job. You know, I'm not the one running the project. So, so I think, and, and if you look at our, our peers, um, a lot of them have not done on time on budget. So I think you know we we're running a project during COVID, and I'm I'm hopeful that it will be on on, on time on time as well. So I think I think track it gives a lot of trust, right? So you see our clients; they are not clients that come for one project and disappears. They are clients that always come for one and goes for the second one and goes for the third one, you know, and gets us for all their bids. So it means that we are we must be doing something right. When the food is good, you come back for more, right? Obviously, <laughs> you know, um, tried and tested appetite. So I want to reel off some of the metrics that uh, you told me earlier, right? Um, ROO, ROEs among the highest in the industry, margins highest, uh, order book number two globally, 17 billion US dollars, yep. sorts you out for the next 20 years at least, right? Um, fleet size, FPSO size, not necessarily the biggest, but you're the most efficient and your FPSOs are among the biggest, right? Yeah. Right, so... Uh, in terms of achieving those metrics, you know, just operationally, how do you get there? Can you talk about those? I think digitalization you know, is very important. Um, having a team that, 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 that plans ahead, you know, having your own systems, you know, it, it's, it's an ongoing investment process that we continue to have, right? Um, and I, 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 I really think we have very good people. <laughs> no, I, I cannot, <laughs> you know, we, we spend a lot of time with our people. I think we have a very good um, team, teamwork. You no, know, if you if you know the Yinsen team in the shipyard and all, um, you know they 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 work together, they laugh together, they fight together. You know, so so I think I think the chemistry is very important. I think one of the mistakes where we talk about in the past when we were building the business, we did hire a lot of top talent. You know, in the industry and and things didn't go as well as we we hope. You know, so sometimes you know running a company is like a, a football team. You need chemistry and and finding. The right people with the right chemistry, you know, you don't need to have you no know, twenty star players. You know, you 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 may need to, you don't even need a star player. You know, and and you still run your projects well. So, so I think we focus a lot on on our 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 cooperation, our values, and and also our chemistry, right, with each other. I think th th I think th that's really what the team has chemistry. Just on the subject of people, right? See, why this uh, this is um, one of those. Um, conundrums that face managements all over the world. Because if you've been doing this only for the last 12 years, in the last 12 years, if memory serves me correctly, there was an oil, oil crunch. And then I think oil prices went to as high as 150 bucks a barrel in 2004. Uh, Iraq, Iraq uh, you know, uh, issues, military conflict issues. Yeah, a couple of years ago during COVID, right? During COVID, demand fell off a cliff. I think at some, at some, in some types of oil, like I think Louisiana, Louisiana light sweet, they were, they were paying people to get uh, barrels of oil off their hands. I think it was minus one or minus two dollars a barrel, right? Yeah. And today we are 88 bucks a barrel, Brent, 86 bucks, West Texas, right? You told me that you think it's going to go beyond 100 uh, by the end of this year, which is insane. So it's all over the shop. A lot of companies shed their people because there was no business. So how do you attract the right people, retain the right people, you know, keep fighting the good fight when times are tough? I think the good part of our business, it's an order book business. What it means is we have a backlog of orders. So we can, you know, and, and our order books you know, are, are things that our clients cannot terminate at will, right? When they terminate, we always joke it's an upside, right? The clients have to pay out the, ter pay, the, clients have to pay out the, the termination fees, which is like a prepayment of your lease, right? So, so having the ability to plan with that order book is, is very important. So you could plan your resources, plan how you're going to, reinvest into different technologies, how you're going to invest in energy transition, you know, things like that, right? And, and how much of your people should be on projects. With, with that order book, it helps a lot. And so you don't really need to shed pe people if you, if you, you, know, you know, like how some people do it, like shed 20-30%. Also always when you're growing, right? Even during the downturn when we saw negative oil price, you know, of course, of course we were worried because um, if it's prolonged, you know, our clients would be in trouble as well. Um, but you know, I think I think we, we didn't make any 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 you know, impulsive decisions and all. We we tried to keep the team together. You know, we had this order book that, that was there, um, which really helped us, you know, plan our cash flows and all. So I think I think having it's a, the kind of business that we are in that allows us to do that. Yeah. 
So when you advise your um, you know, fellow entrepreneurs, right? I mean, some of whom are much smaller than you, but on a much deeper growth trajectory, right? What kind of like business or, or entrepreneurial principles can you pass along in terms of where you succeeded? For example, where, where you are concerned, you are not exposed to the vagaries of oil prices because the NOCs are the ones who can the volatility, right? Yeah. And then you are shielded, but you sit behind that screen where uh, they are investing in you and they pay you on a daily basis, uh, you know, a rate for your FPSOs. Um, how would you advise entrepreneurs to get to that point where you are able to enjoy the upside but are shielded from the volatility? I think you always have to see what you bring on the table, right, um, in, in business. And, and, you know, I would always advise people to look for quality earnings, not one-off earnings, you know. And quality earnings is, is very hard to come by, you know, good counterparties, high quality earnings, you know, and, and typically you get low margins, right, um, when you have high quality com com companies going for you and, and, and high quality earnings. So I think what do we bring on the table is our engineering capabilities, right? And, and we, we are able to deliver, you know, FPSOs at probably the lowest, lowest prices, you know, because we win bids around and I guess lowest prices are, um, in, 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 in the industry given our, uh, given our, our fixed costs and all it's amongst the lowest in the industry. So I think, I think what we bring on the table is really our engineering capabilities bring down the cost. We are able to do this much lower than our clients. That's why our clients choose us um, to execute the projects for them. Um, you know, like I said, engagement with, I always stress engagement with stakeholders is very important. You know, you need to engage so that when you win a project, your banks know that you're about to win a project. They are, they are preparing to fund your projects, things like that. So, you know, think a lot of this needs 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 to in place, right? Um, when when you when you when you win a project and and yeah, I think quality earnings for for the entrepreneurs and really see what value you bring on the table for for your stakeholders. Yeah, but sometimes quality earnings uh, come with a lot of patience, right? And sometimes stakeholders don't have that patience, especially if they funded you private equity. Sometimes if they funded you VC, you know. Sometimes if they're waiting for you to list, and once you list, heaven forbid, you four times a year you got to show. Oh no, year and year growth. So it can be quite a uh, savage, right? Um, how would you advise companies who are in the growth phase to manage their growth and to, to have that quality of earnings, but to be also able to manage the expectations of investors? Like I said, engagement, right? <laughs> engagement is really key, you know. Our investors that know us, they, they know we have a team out there to engage with them. You know, our website, you can try it, you know, within a day we'll respond. You know, we, we, we are very, you know, happy to have feedbacks. You know, we are very happy to respond to inquiries, you know, things like that. So, uh, I think if you see in you know, I mean, we've got project terminations, you know, we've got project cancellations in our 12 years. It wasn't that smooth sailing, but every time there's a project cancellation, there's a termination, you know, we are there, right? We are there to respond. In fact, some of our investors don't call us. You know, we, we arrange a, 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 a meeting with all our investors, our bankers, right? And, and explain to them what's the situation. We don't run away when there's a problem. We are there to engage when there's a problem. And in, in most times, engage even, even when there's no problems, right? And, and update, update people to understand where, where the trajectory of the company will be, right? And I mean, things like, you know, going green and all, you know, it's not, not going to be... Um, profitable from day one, things like that. You also have to engage your investors, right? And so, I, I think engagement is key, right? I mean, I, I don't believe investors are there, to, or, or, or our banks are there to only hear the good stories. They also want to see what, what, where are the pitfalls, right? What, where are the potential pitfalls? And, and if it happens, we just need to be there to address it. And don't, and if it's our problem that we, we it's, it's on our problem, we, we need to be there to solve it, right? And not just pass it to our stakeholders and say. You guys solve the problems yourself. So, uh, yeah, I think I think enga engagement is very key, and they need to just buy into your vision. Do you think it's um, it's a function of the fact that your owner manages as well that you are able to? Because one of the hallmarks of Yunsen in the last twelve years has really been the speed at which you transition from phase to phase to phase. And we'll talk about the green, you know, transition in a few minutes, right? See why? Is do you think it's a function the speed of your ability to to move so fast? because you guys own the business, you control the business, you can make decisions fast. And if so, what does that tell you in terms of maybe institutionalizing the business and bringing in more professionals? Because only bringing professionals, right? They got to get the buy-in of all the... And sometimes they move in a direction which the owners might not want to move. I think, I think on the contrary, right? Most, most companies that see where it's, where, when it's run by the owner, 
they have less buy-in from the employees, you know. <laughs> um, I, I, th I think we, we are quite unique because we, we also feel that we are accountable for the capital that we raise. Um, and, and we actually engage not just our investors and all, we engage our employees as well. Um, and that's something we started not, not too long ago. I must say we should have started it earlier, engaging our employees on, on where the company is going. But definitely, I think the feedback that I've received from my employees has been much better. You know, we have, you know, you know, we used to just report our earnings to 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 investors and banks. Now we report our earnings to our employees, um, and and get them to ask us questions, right? And 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 spur that thought process in our employ and our in our employees as as a major stakeholder of the business to to ask us where the company is heading. And and I think if you rewind back twelve years, I think we did things much faster. Today we don't do things as fast as we used to. Um, you know, sometimes I do hope we can work a bit faster, but we have to balance between speed and accuracy. So, so in the eyes of many people, we are we are moving fast. Just we are just faster. It's all relative, right? And you know, you work in you you see Endeavor, you know, being a board here. I see many companies growing at that speed, which is much much faster than what we are growing at. So, so you know, there's 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 that you know, that envy. And, and and allow you to remember those days when you were going much faster as well. So it's it's yeah, it's it's relative, right? Speed. <laughs> well sixty seven to six point seven billion is hundred X, so that's quite fast. <laughs> but six point seven to six hundred and seventy at the you know, um, that might take a little bit longer and that puts you in, you know, maybe like um Facebook territory already. <laughs> um but just in terms of uh, the some of the setbacks, because I'm sure it's not been linear, yeah, yeah. see why. So talk about some of the setbacks. What happens when you got your project what happened when you got your project terminated? You know, talk about some of the setbacks and where are the lessons from that? I think we learned a lot of lessons from our peers as well. No, not, not, not needing to do a lot of the, the lessons learned ourselves, right? And, and we, we were not early in the industry. We are quite a late comer in this industry and, and we learned from many people before we entered this business. Um, you know, contract negotiations, right? Um, you know, the toughest thing is always going to shareholders and tell them, you know, we're not going to win a job. Uh, the project, why? Because we couldn't agree on terms. Um, and I, I think when you look long term in any business, you need to sign. No, winning a contract is so easy, right? Just give a low price, give up all the terms, you, you sign a contract. And that is the easiest thing to do. But winning a, a profitable contract, you know, a, a contract that, that, that secures the future of the company is a different story. You know, at the right price, you know, at the right terms. I mean, I think we always look long. Um, if people that know us and have followed us, we've walked away from many contracts, I think a lot. Um, and, and every time we get a termination, it's a reminder to our shareholders and bankers as well that why, do we, why is it so hard to sign a contract? It's because there are terms that we need to protect ourselves when it's not our fault, when it's a client's fault, they, 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 their production is down, they, they don't have enough resources or hydrocarbons that they need to produce and they have to terminate the contract. That's when you know, I think our, our stakeholders appreciate the negotiations that we have to go through, right? And our contracts is not negotiated over three months or four months, you know? Most, more often than not, it's negotiated over a year, two years. You know, that's, kind, that's the kind of length that we take to negotiate a contract. And it's because we want to secure the future of the company, right? Which, which is what we do. A lot of the efforts that you see today are, are efforts that are done two, three years ago. So the efforts that we, we do today, you're going to see the fruits of the result two, three years from now, right? And, and I think a lot of people need to be patient when they see results, you know, we, you know and, and, and we, we also need to be patient. Of course, sometimes I'm impatient that you know, things are not going as fast as I hope it would be, but sometimes for good reasons that, that they don't. So it's, it's, a, it's a safer, more sustainable approach of growth um, rather than just growing at all costs, right? Yeah, and uh, of course, during the duration of your contract, during execution as well, some of them can be quite challenging. I remember reading the news a couple of years ago when you were working in Brazil with Petrobras. Uh, that were, that quite, got quite a bit sticky at that time as well. And of course, Brazil itself um, had issues with President Lula. Now it's going on with some issues with Bolsonaro as well. So there's issues percolating within the country itself, which because it's an NOC, it's national, right? So it's a G2G -G thing as well. It affects you guys as well, right? So how do you deal with those issues? I think we don't get ourselves, we try not get to ourselves to get too involved in politics, definitely. So we definitely don't get in, involved itself in Brazilian politics. Uh, our counterparty is Petrobras. We just need to make sure that 
we believe in the future of Petrobras, right? We signed a contract about 20 over years with a company like Petrobras. Um, and, and we need to believe that 20 over years from now, they will be around, right? And, and I think we need to bind to their vision that they are growing, that they will be able to pay uh, their PSOs, that there's enough resources in the company and things like that. So I think that's what we are very focused on. Um, when it comes to any country that we go to, like I said, we, we make sure that over time, at least within the, peri the period of the first five years, we try to localize the whole office, right? And, and we really try to give back to the communities, educate the local, local people on what we do, um, and, and really make sure that we are hiring you know, higher paying jobs in these, in these countries that we go to. So we are you know, making an impact to the, the countries that we work in, right? So that any new countries that we go to, we have a story to tell. You know, we've, been, we've been in Vietnam, what we did. We've been in Ghana, what did we develop? You know, we're going to Brazil, what do we develop? So every country that we go to you know, appreciate our, our investments and, and know that we are not just going there to, take, you know, to, to, to win a project and just disappear. You know, and and not not and bringing or bring everybody in from another country to to run the projects, right? So, it's a lot of time it's about a balance between profitability and impact, and I think that's a, that's that's what we try to do. You know, try to impact the local communities, you know, improve the the, the you know definitely average up the the, the pay in the, the country, um, you know, and and create um, no prosperity in the, the 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 sector that we are in. So that's what we try to do. Yeah, so I think at this point in time, uh, at this level, right, so you are, your, <clears throat> your, work, your waking hours are uh, more strategic rather than technical, I think, right? And I think uh, I can't help but recall when, when Jeff Bezos was interviewed at, at some point, he said that he's a bit like a stargazer. He looks, he has, he's forced to look five, ten years into the future because it's not, as you say, right, um, the work that you do now is for the future and you're safeguarding the future of the company, right? So oil and gas, right, fossil fuels, non-renewable sources, very uh, de degrading to the environment, and of course, under a lot of pressure now. How do you, um, how do you strategize? Because right? I know you've done some investments in India, uh, and, and power to you for, for doing that. But just, just being able to transition from the fossil fuel era to the new era, right? And the decision-making that goes, can you talk about that? I think, like we talk, one of our values in our core values in the company is sustainability, right? And I think for a business to sustain, be t sustainable, you need to make sure that the earth is still around no? when, when, when 20, 30 years from now. I think climate change is something that's real. We see, we see climate change causing lots of damages globally, right? Um, and, and there's a big cost to climate change. And I think something that we need to address. And I, I think we, how we see it is a, is, a, is, a, is a staggered approach, right? You can't just change to electric cars, electric bikes overnight. You can't just change out you know, and, 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 and reduce anything that's emitting carbon overnight. That's why we, we look at ourselves as an energy transition company and not a, a green energy company, nor, nor a fossil fuel company, right? An energy transition. Because I, I think when we, when we transition, we also need to make sure no one is left behind. You know? and, and we can see, right? Uh, and I, I, say, I say this when, when Everyone is pushing for green. I think it's good for the future. It's good for our next generation. But what 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 happens to the the the, the B forty group, right? What happens to on the social matter, matter, right? How 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 do you make sure that these people are not left behind? And we can see more and more when when nobody is investing in supply and demand is and and renewables are there and all these new forms of greener energies are not around. What happens is there's no supply, demand doesn't go down. And and you just have a shortage of supply and oil price goes up, you know. Uh, somebody that, that is rich can just put a solar panel in their house, you know. Um, some you know because it's just additional capex for them. They can transition to a, a electric vehicle. But what about the people where they are living hand to hand to mouth, right? Uh, where do they have the excess cash to 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 change to an electric bike or 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 a solar pa or put solar panels in the house? So I think I think it's quite important to transition in transition is important but not too fast um, because I, I think we also need to think about the social stability for, for, for a lot of people as well. So I think our, our plan is definitely to provide solutions um, to, to, to the poor, right? I know like like when we go in Ghana, when we, we invested in our FPSO, it was to produ produce gas, 
right for Ghana, right? And 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 in when Ghana had gas, it it had power. We had power. It had industries, and it created jobs, right? So the first step was to get was to get um get their power plants moving to create jobs. Then they can probably one day transition into 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 greener fuels. So we're quite proud. No? We're producing, helping them produce power at the cheapest possible price. In India, we are we are producing power um, cheaper than coal, for example, right? You know, and I think that 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 is something that's quite meaningful. You know, having having the purpose to go everywhere and try to produce power at the lowest possible price, provide mobility at the lowest possible price, and 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 not not to serve you know, the rich, you know, but really to serve the 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 man on the street that that can be able to you know improve and uh, bring down the costs in 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 in, in their expenditure bring down their costs like daily costs right and I think that's what we're trying to do yeah and I think you're right in saying that the inconvenience and unspoken truth with the green future is the fact that if you're not uh, financially liquid you're going to be left behind because you can't afford you know the fancy new stuff right mm -hmm. um, if you're advising you know um, high growth um, entrepreneurs now who are maybe venturing out into business how would you advise them to deal with this transition where we know where we're going, but you know, to, to ensure that people don't get left behind? Where are the opportunities? I think this generation of entrepreneurs you know, are in the best timing ever to start a business. You know? You know, you know, in the last 100 years, you have never seen a better timing where, where you can see young startups outgrow multi-generational business. And today, you, you can see young startups outgrow multi-generational business. And and I think a lot of this is because of technology, access of capital. You know, there's so much capital nowadays. It's how you tap the capital, and it's just shortage of ideas, right? And I think, I think, um, startups have today that start have to have to plan, plan definitely plan forward, and and really plan for a sustainable future. I think, I think everyone, you know, everyone in this world prefers a sustainable future. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's a risk for existing business like us, right, where we are in oil and gas and we look at the green future, we can see it as a risk, but it's also a very good opportunity, right? And, and I think in Yinsen, we see a lot of this transition as a great opportunity. And, and I think young startups should see all this as a great opportunity where you have the first time, right? You, you start off scratch. You don't even need to do coal. You don't need to start from, you know how a lot of people will start from coal fire plants, gas fire plants, and they move into renewables. You know, or nuclear, uh, th that part. So every young startup can can skip all these old technologies and just go to the latest technologies and 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 you no know, and provide technology for 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 a more sustainable future. So yeah, I think they 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 don't need to invest. You know, like you know, see Vietnam just skip all the landlines and just go direct into into mobile phones, right? So I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of the young entrepreneurs. And then for Yinsen itself, 6.7 billion ringgit market cap sounds big for Malaysian standards, but actually on a, you know, like for example in the US, yeah. 6.7 billion ringgit is about one and a half billion US dollars. Yeah. And actually, to be honest, that's not very big nowadays. So how do you go from 1.5 billion to 15 billion to 150 billion? Is it even on the cards? Yeah, I definitely. You know, I, I think we, we always try to grow. Um, and 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 I, I do believe this um, renewable business of ours and green technology business is a very scalable business, just like our PSO. Um, definitely being beat this part of the world, we struggle a bit more with capital. Um, you know, rate, there's not, like, like compared to the US, there's, there's lots of capital in US compared to this part of the world, given the, the, the size of the market here. But I guess we always need, you no, know, we, we build a business that, that, that is more than 10 billion in assets. You know, over the last 12 years, we've really a market cap of 67 million, like you said, 12 years ago. So we are in a better position today than ever before. I, I think we've got the resources. You know, we've got resources globally. We've got we've got the, a better balance sheet than we were 12 years ago. And I, I I think there shouldn't there should be it should be an easier task the next 12 years than the last 12 years, right? And 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 definitely we are we have a lot of people in the company that understands energy today very well from all gas renewables green technologies and and i think you know you're you're trying to replace 100 years of infrastructure within the next 10 20 years to get it to carbon zero i don't think there's a better opportunity than that right what what the world took 100 years to build you're going to build rebuild everything in 20 years it's a, a fantastic opportunity Okay, so f forgive me for being a cynic because that's, you know, journalists are cynical by nature, right? But I was listening to, you know, we're chatting outside, right, socially, 
So you are telling me that some of your FPSO rivals, bigger rivals, maybe four or five years ago, were like a bit dismissive of you because they were saying, oh, smaller player, you know, don't worry about you. And then they got complacent. They stayed still. They took a rest. And then you just went, boom, right ahead, right? So for your next 10 years, right, because you are now the big dog in the room. You're number two mm -hmm. globally, or the book. That's massive, right, for, for a basic Malaysian company, right? Um, how are you going to make sure that you basically have the same energy and drive that you had the last 12 years? Well, no, the last 12 years, a lot of the energy, especially the first five of the 12, you know, it's a lot of energy for myself, right? But, you know, you, you cannot rely on energy on yourself all that time. You know, you, you, people do get burned out, and, 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 and I think being able to you know, address yourselves and your people mentally is very important. Um, you know, today, thankfully, the, the company is driven by, by, a, by more, much more people than myself, and and I see the energy that they have, you know, and, and it's my job to provide them the platform, the resources, the capital, you know, and, and, and when they need me to, to support them in, in, in building the business. I mean, it is a, it is a big team, to, a much bigger team that we used to have. And I think it's uh, as CEO and my job to provide them the platform to, to grow, you know, and, 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 and grow towards the, the company's vision. I think we have to recycle our capital. Right. Um, if, if if we can't raise capital at the valuation that we need to, we have to recycle our capital from the entities below. Um, and and really, if you look at our renewable pipeline, for for example, we've built more than a gigawatt of pipeline, and and I think these will come to rotation two years from now. Like I said, I think it's just a, a great opportunity in the energy business. And every new project that we put on, we realize that the energy costs keeps going down, right? You know, today solar is cheaper than, than, than a coal fire plant, right? So there's only one way to, for coal, it's, it's to disappear because solar renewable is so cheap today. You know, so, so I, I really do believe in this, <laughs> this, this net carbon zero future. I always joke around, right? A lot of people have put in commitments, but I'm one of the few that I think 20 years from now, I'm still here to make sure the commitment is fulfilled. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think you gave hints of this in, just now, right? Because um, you do have these ambitions, but you talk about how capital might not be as uh, forward-looking as you, right? And that's why you say you might have to recycle capital. In 10 years' time, right, where is Yunsen going to be? How is it going to look? Does, that, you know, does the business profile envisage yourself having a headquarters somewhere else in the world, maybe? A dual listing elsewhere? Um, where, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe institutional investors have a better idea of what they're trying to do? I think... I think we we always quite proud that we are a Malaysian company, you know, and, and we, we you know if you you know my father and you know a lot of my shareholders they try, especially EPF as well, we try to keep everything in Malaysia as much as we can. Um, I, I I do see you know um, there's progress from the government in Malaysia as well, you know to support the startup industry. You know I see Taufik here. You know there's Panjana that's trying to support the startup industry. You know I think that there are. We are making some small steps in the right direction um, from, from that angle. Um, so hopefully capital will be, um, there will be more capital in Malaysia. But I think being a global business, you, you, we also have to look at what valuations we get for our subsidiaries. You know, it may be a, a listing in Malaysia and different, different, different entities, um, no listing at the right markets, right, where people understand that, that kind of business. But if you talk about 10 years from now, no, we really hope that we hit carbon neutral, right? Meaning, meaning we will still be producing emissions, but we have carbon negative projects that will bring down, bring down the emissions of our FPSOs. We want to look at ourselves as an energy infrastructure player that's not providing just um, no, um, uh, uh, FPSOs, but really power at the lowest possible cost, mobility solutions at the lowest possible cost for, 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 for just the men on the street. Um, so the, the, this is where we are looking at, um, you no, know, really being a, uh, no, an energy infrastructure player. Yeah. Okay. So, so a lot of the successes that you had, right, uh, um, in the last twelve years, has really come of your own volition. But there's a part of the equation which is out of your control. So one of them is, of course, the the public sector. Yeah, the governments and all their idiosyncrasies there. And of course, you've also got elements of luck. I think luck is something we discussed outside, and it's something that we don't really acknowledge in the business world as having an instrumental or material influence, but it exists, right? So can you talk about luck first and then government second? Because I know government is a tough one. <laughs> I think luck is definitely important, you know. 
you know, meeting the right people, meeting the right partners. You know, some people spend a lifetime to not even meet a single right partner. And I've been, I've been very lucky to meet the right partners in the last 12 years, right? From, I mean, I, I, I got a great partner in Vietnam, you know. Um, they, they've been very supportive of every partnership. You have your disagreements, but you no, know, we solve the dis disagreements with respect with each other. You know, we, 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 we have a partner in EPF. You know, they were great. You know, they, they've been very supportive in our growth. Um, you know, so they've been they've been a very good partner for Yinsen. They sit on our board as well, and and and, and I think they are very important for the whole Malaysian, uh, for Malaysian businesses, right? To provide capital, um, to support the businesses to grow not just locally, but but internationally. Um, you know, we early days when we needed capital at that point in time where we were too small for EPF, we we managed to find um, a, a company called Kanchana Capital that invested in us and provided us that capital when we needed to 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 do an acquisition of of a Norwegian company. I know I really think we've been lucky to meet the right people and these these partners today we still talk right so they they must have been great partners and I think we must have been great partners to them as well right so so. <laughs> So, so I, I think all in all, I think yeah, you need the luck to meet the, the 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 right people and 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 the right clients that honor your contracts and things like that. So, so yeah, you know, there's a lot of you no know, knowledge that you need. You need a lot of wisdom in in finding the right partners, but you no, know, still luck plays a big role. Yeah, of course, uh, Tantri Mogzani at Kanchana, right, way back in the day. Um, but do you believe in what Gary play? You know, Gary play the South African. A golf golf professional, mm. he said that you are as lucky as you, you your luck is directly proportional to the amount of work that you put in, which in which in other words means you make your own luck. Do you believe in that? I think in both. You know, you need to be there to to achieve, um, to to make the right decisions, to to tap on the opportunity when it's there, right? But but you need the the luck to to see the opportunity. So I think it's both, right? You know, uh, you know, we early days. You know, I I was working, you know, f 18 hours days, right, every day, right, to 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 make sure that I get to see any opportunity that's out there, and even today, you know, I still spend 12 hours, um, at least 12 hours a day working to to make sure that I get to see as much opportunities as I can, and not just learn opportunity, but uh, opportunity to learn, and I I guess you know when I when I graduated, you no, know, I used to see the bigger conglomerates and and. And and I, where luck is less relevant now, I'm going to is is in in the past, right? I when I came out, I, I met a big bigger conglomerate, and they always had this knowledge that I would never get. You no, know, when they want to learn about, when they want to learn about, you no, know, for example, you no, know, um, IT, right? They will go to Intel. Someone from Intel, some some VP of Intel will be guiding them on that. You know, today, honestly, you know, with 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 technology, you know, with YouTube. You know, it really flattens the learning curve. Which I say, it's the biggest opportunity for all the young entrepreneurs today. You know, I, I, I'm not shy to say. You no, know, I learned a lot of my FPSO knowledge on YouTube, right? Uh, before we, <laughs> before we hired, we before we hired great professionals to 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 really teach me more on on, on what FPSO was, right? But definitely, the the day <laughs> when we entered FPSO, it was really from 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 Google and YouTube where we started learning, and then. You know, we built a great company through YouTube <laughs> and Google, right? <laughs> and even today, right, you learn how to build culture, you learn how to build values, you build, learn a lot, a lot more. And these learning platforms is, is where you can learn and, and you, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to, you know, meet great people, in, you know, senior people in great organizations today to learn. So it really flattens the playing field. So if you were trying to manufacture the model entrepreneur, right, uh, CY, what would be the top, say, five ingredients a, a person has to be to be a successful entrepreneur? Well, uh, you said five. Right? There, there's a lot. No, you need to you make have the right character, definitely, right? Um, and and I think there to try. I always oh, encourage. Wait, hang on. What do you mean by character? What does character mean? Character means you know a lot of things like like you're willing to put in the hours, the effort, take the right, take the risk. You know, um, not just risking other people's money, but your own as well. No, really, spend, risking your own time. Um, you know, there to tr you know having the, the 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 resilience, right, to to push through. You know, you know there are times when early days, when in the in the early part of twelve years, where we won a project without having the capital, and we never knew whether we would find the capital, right? We had to, you know, after winning the project, we had to really talk to banks. You know, we had to we had to sell assets. Did the client know that you had no capital. 
I mean, the client, the client didn't know because we were, we were, we thought he thought we were funded, but we eventually funded it, you know. But but these are the things you do when you were much smaller. You, you, you see an opportunity and you pounce on it, right? And and I think a lot of people wouldn't have done it because they were just worried that oh, what if I don't have the capital? But it wasn't something that 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 stopped us. And and I mean, talk about great opportunities. You know, you talk about Elon, right? I was reading one of his books and. He never worried about capital. You know? <laughs> he just did whatever he felt was right, and 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 that's what I think. I think we should we should do and really, you know, break down the barriers that we think that cannot be achieved, and and try to achieve it. And you know, when we bought, um, like I example, when we wanted to buy Fred Olson, I think a big part of our team said, "Where we're going to find the capital from?" And at that point in time, we didn't have the capital, but we closed the deal, right? And 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 we bought the company and. And he gave us the 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 hundred X that 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 you were talking about, right? And and I, that's why I said character, you know, really, really the resilience, the way to push things forward, um, is is just so important, right? Did other members of your team or your family have that same resilience? And is it is it the case where one person can really drive an entire organization into you know billion ringgits value? Is it really the case? I think the energy from the leader needs to be there. The energy will will just go down to to the staff, right? And then, and over time, everybody will get that energy. But if the the as a leader, your energy is always, how do I do this? I can't do that. I can't do this. I think it also goes down, right? And you know, and and it and you can see an organization change quite a lot, having the different kind of energy at the top, um, having having the, the the kind of vision at the top. And really communicating and engaging people into your your vision, right? I I did less of that in the early days. I'm doing more and more of that today, and I, I can see the results. You know, when when I communicate more to employees, when I talk to them, when when we have platforms to communicate globally, you know, and and I think I think that has worked quite well. Yeah. So um, okay, quick word on governments, right? Because I said we we're going to talk about it. So obviously. You know, the U.S.-China trade war is an issue. China is getting bigger. There's some concern around that. Malaysia continues to have its own travails. Um, the whole region seems, seems to be moving faster. I don't know, maybe with a vacuum, we see it from a different lens. Um, how does that play into your planning for the long term? Because obviously, you know, as a private sector company, you still have to deal with the vagaries of the public sector. Um, I, I believe a lot of people fail. and they, I know you, you go out and hear people talk about um, Malaysian government, or, or it's the government, it's a government... Sometimes I think people use government, like feng shui, like we were talking about, as an excuse of a failure. Um, and 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 I think I think that's what a lot of people do. I can't get a project because government's not good. No, my life's not good because government's not good. I don't think government's here to 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 really tell you, you know, to to change your life. You have to change your own life, right? You know, and and you, know, you can talk about good governments, right? You go to Singapore, people are saying that. You know, where people you, you can talk about Norway, people are saying the same thing about their government, right? So I think these are reasons f for people to fail, and 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 that's how most people think of governments, right? So, you know, in some we we have offices in every con nearly every continent in 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 the world, and and you know we, you know, I th I don't see government as a as a as a reason for failure. I think if you've got a great project, you've got a great, you've got a, you know, you're going to make an impact to any com country, the government will be there to receive you, right? No government in the world will stay in their position by not doing the right job and, and not doing their job well by saying no to investment, by saying no to jobs, right? And, and I think that, that's really what government wants to do, create an, uh, 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 an awareness, create industries, and create jobs. And that's what you know, everyone wants to do, especially high-paying jobs. And I think we just need, and everywhere we go, we do that, like I said. So I don't see us having big issues with governments. Um, and and we, we, we're quite diversified in different countries, so there's some safety in that sense. We, we are not dependent on one country. So you know, all things said and done, I, I, yeah, I, I think, I, you know, we work in so many countries, right? I, I think Malaysia government's all right. You know? <laughs> I really don't see a problem with that. No, you know, and and you can talk about the we we have offices in Singapore, we have offices in Norway, we have offices in 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 no Africa, right? And so I, every time people complain about government, I think it's just a reason for failure. Governments are governments, right? See why? Okay, so yeah. you talk about Elon, right? And Elon is a bit of a weirdo, actually. If we have to be honest, right? But he's built a trillion dollar company, and he's got literally like. 
four, maybe five companies and approaching that kind of territory with the SpaceX and the mining company, the boring company, uh, and Tesla as well. Um, and then you've got people like Jeff Bezos. You know, Jeff Bezos, of course, is another weirdo. Right? He's built a huge company. Um, but do you, what do you think goes through their minds? Right? What do you think they fret about? Because they, you, you, it's only once in a lifetime that you come across a guy like Steve Jobs who then has the, the good fortune to have a Tim Cook there who can carry the mantle forward, right? The added dimension for you guys at Yinsen is that you're a family company, Asian company, right? Uh, how are you going to navigate this next 30 years where, you know, you're not going to look this young forever, do you know what I mean? Unless you swallow the magic pill, right? <laughs> See why? Mm -hmm. But how, how, do you, how do you get that, that, that continued bursts of growth? Uh, you know, uh, like, like I said earlier, on, we've been investing a lot more in our uh, graduates today. We are trying to get the best graduates we can find. You know, we, we hire, and you talk about Malaysian, but you look at our whole senior team, and there's hardly any. There are Malaysians. It's a very diversified in terms of nationalities. I think there's, you get a national, one, no, a few, a few, you know, get, you got Danish, you got Norwegians, you have, you have British, you have Malaysian, Singaporean. No, it's very, it's a very, you know, multinational kind of senior management. And even within our company, there's, I think, more than 40 nationalities with it. So I think the beauty about that, what I'm coming to is, the ability to attract talent from a wide pool of, of countries. That's the number one thing. And I think over time is to pick the right people um, and train them from, from, from when, once they graduate and train them in our culture, in our value system. Um, and I think that's, that's very important, right? And I hope we continue to train. You know, I tell our people, to not, to, you know, what's the worst thing they can do when you do a mistake? You know, at least your boss probably tells you off and that's it, right? Yeah. Okay, so I know this, this might be a little bit politically uh, incorrect, um, but I'm going to ask you anyway, right? Um, is it possible to generalize among all the nationalities that you work with and identify which ones are good or maybe slightly better than the rest? And I'm going to say, for example, um, with the Indian nationals, right? They've provably demonstrated an ability to lead big companies. Ajit Jain at Berkshire, uh, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, um, you know, Sundar Pichal at Google. Um, is, are there commonalities among a certain kind of people that you know, really say, okay, well, these are the guys that can may maybe take my company to the next level. When it's time for you to hang up your boots, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, think, I think every nationality has ex exceptional people, right? You can't really generalize which Can you talk about them? Oh, no. We, I mean, we've got, we've got people from Danish as one side of the culture curve, right? If you look at, if you read the culture books, you know that they're very straightforward. And, and I like that culture, right? You're straightforward to the point, but it's very offensive to some people, right? And, and you have the other side where, where Malaysia, I know Malaysia is probably on right the other end as well, and India even further <laughs> down, right? But, but where you tell your boss the, the things they want to hear, right? And, you know, and, and it's really having, that's why it's so important to have your own culture, right? Having your own culture so that everybody understands this is the way we work. We are, for, we are straightforward, we are, we are direct, you know, but no hard feelings, we try to be respectful, things like that. So I I I no, I've met exceptional people from 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 no my 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 CEO of um of FPSOs is a Danish he's, he's an exceptional guy right you know he what he, makes him exceptional he's very organized he's very he's very organized he he knows what's his one he he goes for it he executes well right um, but he's a execution guy he's not a strategy guy he's a strategy guy that's why he's a CEO right yeah, so but he executes the strategy well. Right, strategy normally is di dictated from our management, right? And and he's part of the one that drives the strategy, and 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 of course he executes it. I th I think he executes it quite well. You know, then we, we we you know, and and we have people from India as well. You know, I've got a great I've got a great guy in India. Um, he's the country manager. He reports to my renewable CEO. And and you know, and what he, makes him good? You no, know, he he understands the local culture very well. We, at the, we, we make very bad decisions sometimes without knowing the culture of the country, without knowing what things are, right? And, 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 and he's on the ground to tell us, you know, hey, you don't do this in India. What you know, don't you do in India? I, know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think, I think things always go last minute in India. Um, you, know, you, you, you know, for announcements and all, you wait till the last minute. You, you have to, you, you're not, you, you sometimes you, you don't need to be the champion to be the first to, 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 to announce something that you shouldn't need to and, and you wait. And sometimes the government will say, okay, this is something that, um, that we, will, we will handle, right? Things like that. So it's just, you can't be that 
that quick to, to, to be open, right? <laughs> in certain countries. Um, and, and the government then knows the problems, for example, and, 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 and they will address it, right? And so, so, you know, so I've got good people from, from different nationalities and, and, and yeah, I, I think I'm quite lucky to, to have these people around me. So if you were to have the same quantum of growth that you have and th that you had in the last 12 years, going forward the next 12 years, that would make you a 670 billion ringgit company <laughs> or about a 150 billion uh, US dollar company, right? And b sometimes we forget how small Malaysia is. Malaysia, Malaysia's biggest company is Maybank, about 85 billion ringgit, which is only about 20 billion US dollars. 20 billion US dollars in America is, is tiny, right? Tiny. Uh, until about two weeks ago, uh, Apple was about $3 trillion. Microsoft is well over $2 trillion. Uh, Tesla, Elon, your good friend, uh, <laughs> um, he built a trillion dollar company in basically 18 years. It's crazy, right? Uh, maybe less than that. So I, I don't, I, well, re correct me if I'm wrong. Apart from Petronas, we, have, we don't have a private sector company, a uh, non GLC, that has really become a huge uh, global behemoth, right? Are you going to be the one? I, I, think, I think it's not fair to say that. We have great companies here as well that do, 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 do work overseas, right? We have the manufacturing companies that sell globally um, and their model may eventually maybe they will produce things and sell to end consumers themselves. We don't know, right? Um, no, we have you know, companies like Asia that, that's very regional and uh, perhaps global as well, you know, flying to, to, to Japan and all. So I, I think... Well, the proof is in the pudding, right? Um, um, you know, PN17 is, is not 650 billion US dollars. Uh, okay, closed door, apart from the internet watching. Um, no, so in all seriousness, right, um, there is a chance. I mean, there are some good companies, yourself included, that might be, you know, the sea limiteds of this world, the Bukala parts of this world one day. I, I think we try, right? I think we have ambitions to grow, grow to be a very global player and, and be, to, you know, where we are with FPSOs, right, to be number one, number two in globally in the business that we do. Um, but, you know, FPSOs, uh, you know, we grew from nothing to, to where we are, number two biggest in order book globally. Um, and, and there's potential that our renewables can grow there, our green technology business can grow to that level as well, right? We need to just keep working hard. Um, you know, but I don't think that target growing, growing and saying, I want to be there, um, I want to be another 100x from today, is the target. I think the target would be really to, to, to make sure that we continue to impact the lives of, of our, our clients, you know, and go and impact the, the communities that we work in. And I think if that's the target and, and, and just work hard every day to, to be better at doing something the last year, right? Every year you need to get better at doing what you're doing. So with that mindset, I think, I think we may get there, may not get there, but it's something that, that we, you know, we, we try our best, right? Just like we never thought that we should be doing a one billion or two one billion dollar projects at the same time, right? Five years ago, right? We just kept trying to get better at doing an FPSO, kept get bet, you know, kept building our resources, reinvesting in, in building building a more digital FPSOs, and you know, we and when the opportunity arose, we, we took on two one billion dollar FPSOs at the same time, right? And then I think that that that's how we how we see things, growing at the right pace. I yeah. thought that was actually quite instructive because rather than take a numerical approach to growth, as in like, I want 100x from here on in, you are looking at it from a very uh, contextual basis in the sense that uh, you want to affect the communities and make a difference, right? Yeah. So that can seem a little bit softer, but that can also mean it's a much more meaningful in the long term. Was, that, was I right in, in saying that that could be more profound than, than I thought? I think, I think for any business to be sustainable, right, and, and, and to, to, to do well, you need two things, right? You need to make sure your, your clients are very happy with you, right? So they see value in what you're doing and, and, and your, your vendors as well, you know, are, are well sorted, right? You cannot have your vendors losing money and your clients feel that they're overpaying you all the time. You need a, a relationship where but both sides of, of the end, uh, you know, your, con your clients and your, your vendors and all are, are benefiting. It's only when they feel that their lives are impacted, they, there's a lot of value in the product that you give them. Um, know that, that the business will be successful and I think that's, that should be the focus of any business to make sure the clients are happy and, and, and their vendors are happy, right? And, and the employees are happy, right? I think it's a very silly model where, where you have, you have your, your clients you know, forced to use you and your vendors are forced to use you, right? 
because some some day or another somebody's going to start another platform, or someone's going to start something else, and it's so easy to bring your clients and your vendors over to to the new company, right? So, I I I think that should be the focus of the business, and I I guess if you if you if people if you bring that kind of value on the table, your business should be will be successful, right? It was a sheer, it was a sheer delight talking to you, CY. Um, I think I got tr some of the secret sauce from you, and I, I really do honestly, genuinely wish you the best of luck. I do want to see you become 67 billion and 670 <laughs> billion ringgit because when I talked to you in 2010, I, I kicked myself even till today that I didn't get some of the Yinsen stock. So, um, yeah, so honestly, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for your insights, and really, it's, it's a real pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, thanks, thanks for your time as well. Thank you. Yeah.